What is up? Welcome to Etsy Jam. Is anything really original anymore? Is it possible to create something completely original? Has everything already been done? In this episode, Richie and I seek to answer these questions. What is up, guys? Welcome to Etsy Jam. I am Gordon from Marmalade. And I'm Richie from Marmalade. And if you don't know, Marmalade is the best Etsy SEO and market research tool for serious sellers. So if you're serious about your Etsy shop, go take a look at Marmalade. It's kind of like Marmalade, but different spelling. So it's M-A-R-M-A-L-E-A-D. So check us out. This podcast, again, is made possible by it. So definitely go check it out and, uh, you know, support your shop. So, Gordon, we are here to talk today about how nothing is original. Nothing. That sounds kind of scary. Not even, not even this podcast. That's true, because we're basing this <laughs> off something, aren't we? We're That's right. iterating yeah. on an original idea. On some, well, actually, we're not even iterating on an original idea. We're iterating <laughs> on an idea that iterated on, an on another idea. idea. Yeah. Nothing oh, yeah. is original, but that's okay. That's okay. Is it? It sounds I think depressing. It's totally okay. It does sound kind of depressing when you think of it like that. But I think the key is to like change the perspective, right? So it depends how you define original, right? Original to me is like this is the first time anything like this has ever existed. Okay. That's how I would personally define original. And you could look it up and I might be totally wrong. Maybe you have a different definition, Richie. But that's when I when I think of original, that's what I'm thinking of. The first time that this has ever existed in this form, right? Um, like uh, like the world is round. Yeah, like that. Like uh, before or, that, or gravity. we literally thought it was flat. Or gravity. And before that. Before gravity, we never even con- considered yeah. that there was such a thing holding us to the ground. Yeah, yeah. So gravity might be an original idea. Maybe, although I don't know. I mean... Is it? I don't know. <laughs> That's where it gets really tricky, right? But so if we think of these things in, in those terms, like kind of a very black and white way of thinking of original, yeah, that could get kind of depressing, right? Because anytime anyone plays any note on any musical instrument, that note has been played before, right? Like even what? if this is the first time anyone's played a trumpet and they play a concert B flat, that note's been played before. That's not a new tone, right? That's been heard before. It's just on a different instrument. It sounds a little bit different. It works the same way as other instruments had in the past. But it's not original, original. It's not the first time that's ever happened. So it could get kind of depressing when you think of it like that. But I think the way, the important way to think about it is that these things that get derived from other things, they can still be original. This could be the first time anyone has put these different instruments together. Maybe they've never played together in the past and played a piece of music that is in this style. Right? Maybe that style's been played before on other instruments and stuff like that, but this is the first time it's happened for this in this situation with these specific, you know, pieces and components, and that in and of itself altogether is original. Oh, so you're saying you could take the same building blocks, the same foundational blocks, arrange them differently and get something that's original. Ish. Yeah, I mean, I think if you don't want to live depressed your whole life about never experiencing anything original, you kind of have to think of it like that. What about Uber? Is Uber original? Like, you know, the, the app where you can call a car to come pick you up and drive you from where you are to somewhere else? No, Like, Knight that's got to be that. new. Knight Rider. David Hasselhoff, that's, Kit. That's a, oh, wow. So you're, what you're telling me really is that <laughs> even though they're, they're, they're telling me that Uber was, they call it disruptive, a disruptive innovation. Yeah. Really, they've just taken, you know, a cue from... David Hasselhoff's Knight Rider. Yeah. His car that he just calls, picks him up, and drives him places. Yeah, pieces, right? I mean, they definitely, it's an original idea that has hit mainstream. Like, nothing like Uber has, has existed in the form that it exists, right? But before that, like, we were kind of chatting before, and you mentioned taxis, right? Yeah, taxis existed before. There wasn't this idea that people could kind of be their own like employee of their own company running around and picking people up in a taxi. You're part of a union. You all kind of like you rely on the taxi company for work, blah, 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 blah. So it's a little bit different, but it's kind of the same idea. They borrowed that whole idea from taxis and were maybe inspired by different apps that already existed. Maybe they were inspired by Knight Rider. You never know. 
uh, it seems like Tesla kind of is with the, with the cars that they're coming out with that are going to run around and drive people around for you when you're not uh, using them. But the idea in and of itself isn't completely original. No, I would say not. Actually, Tesla itself isn't completely original either. I mean, they have just a couple models. They are really focusing on supply chain and whatnot. Sounds a lot like Ford and the original Model Ts. Right? So if you look at a lot of the other brands, including Ford right now, they have something like 15, 17, 20 models, and they might even have sub-brands. Um, I'm not sure how many Ford's, Ford kept, right? They used to have like Ford, Lincoln, Mercury. Uh, uh, I feel Ford like there were others. Ford. Yeah. I think they got rid of a lot of that stuff. They did. They trimmed it up. I think up. they sold off. Yeah. Uh, but they still have a lot of models, right? Whereas Tesla, they're really focusing on a couple things, a couple models. And they're even pre-selling things, which are which is a little bit different. Uh, but coming back to the Uber, what it really seems like, the only hang-up between what Uber has done, which is considered hugely disruptive, Mm-hmm. and new, original, authentic, etc. cetera, uh, it seems like they've really just kind of solved one really simple problem. It would be hard for you to be your own, like, to, hey, I have a car, I will drive people around. Yep. It would be hard to do that yeah, good because when you, people. right, you can't find the people. But the second one is, <laughs> how do people contact you? Now, or- taxis have a, have a dispatch service. You call yellow cab company and you say hey i need someone to pick me up they radio a cab and say hey can you go to this address pick this person up right well if you're just a person what are you going to do go around and hang out hand out business cards out in the world and that's the thing too like imagine imagine if you're just driving around the city like with a big sign on your car that says like hey i'll pick you up and drive you somewhere there's a whole nother component of like is anyone gonna trust that who's gonna look at that (laughs) and be like oh that sounds great i think i'll get in that guy's car like i don't know (laughs) I don't know. Maybe if I was by myself, but not with my family. <laughs> What's the word? If I was driving around with the sign of my car, you wouldn't, wouldn't trust oh, this if, if I knew you, man, I'd be like, yeah, I'll, that's cool. Seems legit. No, you didn't know nice. me, though. I mean, oh, if I don't yeah, know I mean, you? Just look. Yeah, I was no. smiling like this. Uh, creepy. And you'd be like, creepy. I instantly oh. know you. I'd just like Come pretend on. I didn't see you and like... <laughs> I'd be like, hey, hey, you over there. I know you need a ride. Come, <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I saw you see me. I know you saw me. You can't look away. <laughs> <laughs> you in the witty shirt. Come on, just get in the car. <laughs> no. No. no, that wouldn't work? No. I don't know. Uh, I'd be pretty leery. I so guess it depends. It, uh, it doesn't depend. I'd be leery. <laughs> in its foundation, let's talk about what Uber did there. They took a business model that already existed, okay? Taxis. People were already calling taxis. People weren't always thrilled about the experience. I don't know about you, but um, we've definitely had plenty of experiences. Like, you know, you're out with your buddies uh, hanging out and taking a taxi home, doing the responsible thing. And you call and the taxi never shows up, right? Like 30, 40 minutes later, when they said they're going to be there, taxi never shows up. You call them back and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll send somebody. What, what the heck? Seriously? Like you, we call and you, just, you don't, no one shows up. This is ridiculous. It's crazy. Well, Uber says, well, let's see, we can take this uh, concept of people are looking for rides, taxis have proven that, uh, apps on phones are supremely popular and uh, they, they know where you are, right? Because they have GPS. Uh, people don't really like calling, especially, you know, you're in a bar, it's loud, et cetera. Plus it's inconvenient, who, who calls anymore, right? Like, so there's a lot, <laughs> a lot of people are saying that the phone part of your phone is the least used thing about it, right? <laughs> Everyone's if you look at battery up. percentage, it's always at the bottom. That's true. And if you see it even like 1%, you're like, who did I talk to? <laughs> who did I talk to for four hours? Did I talk to someone the last seven days? That's weird. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. How did this make the list? Right? It's weird. Yeah. Um, so they've taken that. They took just a couple of these pieces and the concept that people were looking. They have a car that's sitting out there. And, you know, hey, I could make a little extra money with a side hustle. I could drive people around at night or on the weekends. Right, which is really popular. A lot of people are doing that. Uh, they're filling it in between. I took a couple Ubers, and uh, actually twice, people told me the same thing. They work as uh, oh, what do you call it? Like a roadside assistance. So mm. they work a roadside assistance gig. So, but with that, you're kind of just hanging around waiting for a call, and then they go out and help people, give them a jump, change a tire, stuff like that. They do that through the insurance. Like they work as a contractor through insurance companies that do that. Um, 
And in between that, they put up Lyft and Uber, right? Lyft being the competitor to Uber that's basically the same thing from what I can tell, except they put mustaches in the car. Um, but anyways, they do that in between. So they kind of, they fill the gaps in their other work day with these like driving people around wherever they happen to be. So there's this underemployment concept. They kind of take these building blocks together and they're like, all right, taxi that you call from your phone. Boom, disruptive. Yeah. Everyone goes nuts about it. It's crazy. Um, but original? No, they did not they did not create a demand. They did not create a need. They were not the first ones to say, hey, I bet people really want to get, you know, get like a ride without driving themselves from point A to B. Like, yeah. oh, people have been flagging down taxis forever. I don't even know when the first taxis were around, but they were definitely around for those old like Sherlock Holmes stories, right? And the Jack the Ripper stories back in London, right? They were around for that. So it's a very old business. Very old. Not original whatsoever. You think cavemen had taxis? You think they'd give like piggyback rides? I mean, that's a good question. That's a good question. I mean, maybe. Probably. It had to it had to start with like horses or something. Or I don't know. Like look at like rickshaws, right? Like people like wheel of carts around, so maybe it was even before people had used horses for stuff. Maybe they that like, is, would wheel people on carts. That's a great point. The rickshaws. The I rickshaws. Know. I mean no, no, that's a good point. That's that's a legit thing. Rickshaws oh, might dude. have been the original taxis. Think of like the, the old school stuff like where they like hold people up. There are people that would carry them like on a board or whatever, right? Like actual people walked people. Don't they do it with the with like the Pope or something? I, I think he's got like a special golf cart. Okay. I'm displaying my ignorance at this point. <laughs> I feel like I'm but they seen, probably uh, used to. I, Before I feel he like had I'm the golf seen... cart. <laughs> the original Pope? The original Pope Mobile was like people carrying him. So even the Pope Mobile is not original. <laughs> I, I feel like I've seen depictions of like in like ancient Egypt of yeah, people yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like that. carrying people on chairs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So again, somebody at some point back in London, uh, back before Sherlock Holmes, decided that, hey, I've got a car now. I can pick people up, drive people around. Yeah. From point A to B. And they'll give me stuff for it. And it was disruptive. And it was disruptive about it all over the place, all over the place. But there's stone tablet blogs, and, they and they're like, "Hey, with yeah. their carrier pigeons." That's another good example. Because <laughs> <laughs> hey, here's the thing: the whole thing Twitter's based off of is you can't say more than what is 160 words, 140. Yeah, it's 140 characters, yeah. 140. I think text messages were limited to like 160. That's why I got confused. So 140 characters. Well, that's because anything bigger than 140 characters. A carrier pigeon couldn't carry because it was too heavy. So, <laughs> you know, That's you could use I that mean, at your trivia night. These birds are flying around, and you put a message that's too heavy there, and yeah. they just they don't make it. Yeah. And you don't you, want. They get yeah. tired, right? They get tired, and they don't make yeah. it. So what you'd have to do, you have to break your message into 140 character multiple chunks, pigeons. yeah, and multiple pigeons, and then you just write like continued, yeah. right? Part one of seven yeah and what helped you keep track of those also is hashtags because it mm -hmm. could be a while from one pigeon to the next right because sometimes they stop and they get hungry and you're like wait what's this about and like, oh no no hashtag not original that's yeah hashtag so that's, no. what, what was that H hashtag feed the wolf uh, yes hashtag feed the wolf because also you know, back then you couldn't count on the messages being delivered in the same order either. So again, hashtags would help because you'd be like, wait a minute, this message doesn't make any sense given what we were just talking about. Oh, wait, no, no, hashtag, it's something else. That's right. Cool. All right, hashtags. All right, all right. I... <laughs> so so how, how does Uber, uh, carrier pigeons, ta uh, taxis, popemobiles, uh, and hashtags help my Etsy shop? Great question, Gordon. How do they help? I don't know. Why did we talk about this? No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Uh, <laughs> the whole point of this, the whole point of all of this is that even if you have this mindset that nothing is original anymore and everything is a derivative of something else, don't let that originality, don't get caught up in that when you're making something. Don't feel like it has to never have been done before, right? If you see something somewhere else that's sort of similar to what you want to make, 
but then you're like, oh, I can't make this because it's going to be copying that. Like, obviously, copying is a separate thing. You don't want to copy someone on something like that. That's not cool. Uh, people do that? Yeah, they do. That sucks. Um, but make it original. Make it your own. And to make it original doesn't mean you have to start from scratch and start all over again and come up with something that's never been seen before anywhere else. It's okay yeah. to take something that someone else is doing, make it your own, make changes to it, make it better than you think they're doing it. Um, make it fit a slightly different niche than they're targeting with their product. Agreed. hundred percent. I think that a lot of times we hold ourselves to too high of standards and think that, um, I think it kind of goes along with the same concept of the overnight success that you typically see in media, right? Like Facebook, you go from zero to hundred billion dollar company and that happened like overnight. Well, actually it didn't, it looks that way. And you go from, you know, uh, from zero to supremely disruptive, brand new, innovative idea. Um, everyone thinks their new idea or product has to like solve the world's problems in one fell swoop, but really it's all just iterations of stuff. Now, this isn't the episode we're gonna talk all about this, but it's related in this book right here. It's called Steal Like an Artist by this guy named Austin Kleon. And he's pretty cool. I he's checked out some of his different stuff. Or an artist. We don't know. Well, I think we'll he kind of says artists artists are thieves in a set in a in a sense, cool. right? But I won't Yeah, there's there's a line of good and bad, right? And he has he has a chart in here that I won't I won't go through and find because we'll do another episode on that. But there when you're if you're just copying something, right? So if I'm like, hey, I want to write a book about, you know, creativity and like creativity and art, I'm just gonna copy all of his ideas. No, that's awful. Right. But if I read this and I'm like, oh man, you know what? There's there's stuff I can add to this counterpoints or uh, I would explain things differently. I've got a new perspective on the book, well, I can go write a book on creativity and art and originality, right? I mean, we're not stealing his book by doing this podcast, right? Uh, even though what we're talking about is similar, we're completely approaching it in a different way, right? So you don't have to be like, hey, I need to talk about a topic that's never, ever, ever been discussed before. It's crazy. I mean, now, I will say this too, though, on the, on the subject of copying things, copying is easy, right? It's easy to go look at something someone else has made and try and recreate that exact same thing or something as close to it as possible. Don't get creative, don't be original with it, and then post it and try to sell it, right? Someone has already built this thing. They have probably found that there's uh, people willing to buy this thing. So let them do the hard work and just copy that. And I'm gonna list it myself and kind of, you know, capitalize on the work that they have already done. It's pretty crappy. And the person who makes the product probably hates it. But there is one good thing about copying and that's that it drives innovation and it drives originality. Because if you make something, somebody copies it, someone else copies it, a third person copies it, and then the others copies everywhere, all right? Mm -hmm. If you don't keep innovating and keep pushing yourself forward, you know, you're gonna, you're now competing with these people. But you have to use yep. what you have, use your originality, use what got you to that, making that first product in the first place, and use that to make another one. And constantly stay ahead of them. And so the copying, while terrible as it is and as frustrating as it is, it actually helps to drive things forward and help develop new products out there. I, yeah, but to be clear, I definitely don't condone that. I think they're awful people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's super, it's super terrible for someone to do that. And yes, it, it's happened to us in the past that people have copied, like blatantly looked at what we've done and copied it. But Yep. It just pushes us, right? We can either look at that and kind of like we talked about in the Feed the Wolf episode, we can look at that and be like, blah, blah, blah. or, you know, we can try and push forward from where we are and stay innovative, stay original mm -hmm. and stay on the cutting edge, talk to people, make sure we're giving people what they want and more. And so that you kind of had to take it that way. Yeah. Copiers will never be innovators themselves because they'll be stuck in a copying rut. So if someone does copy your stuff, it sucks and they are horrible. Completely agree with you there. But they also will never have the originality that you have, which yeah. drove you to do that and will drive your future further and advantage. further beyond what they could ever yep. do, right? Like you'll always be ahead. I mean, consider this, like there is Disney World, right? And Disneyland, and those seem to do pretty all right. Disney seems to be doing okay. But there's also Universal Studios, right? They are different, but they're the same. They're both theme parks. They're both character theme parks, right? Based on like kids' movies and stuff like that, but they have differentiation to them. Uh, 
I don't know how many people know about Cedar Point, right? Cedar Point being the roller coaster up in roller coaster park up in Sandusky, Ohio, that you know Gordon and I would have grown up around. Um, but there's also Six Flags, which people are probably more familiar with, and other parks like that around the country and the world that have roller coasters, but they differentiate themselves in different ways, right? Like Cedar Point, it, I think they don't even call themselves like a theme park or anything. They call themselves like a roller coaster park or like a coaster something or other. It's part of their branding. Like they, they differentiate. And their big thing is they keep coming out with roller coasters because, again, it's all about roller coasters, not the theme, um, that are like constantly breaking a record for this or that, yeah. right? That's kind all of their thing. The fastest, biggest drop, all that stuff. Makes you the sickest. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you will wish you had died. Most head trauma. It's, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Eight out of nine people uh, report uh, significant neck trauma after riding this ride. That's more than any other roller coaster in the entire world. That's, we're really proud. <laughs> Chiropractors love us. <laughs> yes. yes. So. With all this being said, you know, like differentiation, right? And iterating on and adding your own ideas to things that already exist in the world is a great way to, uh, well, actually to showcase your own innovation, but to kind of get yourself out of blocks and like creativity blocks and stuff as well. I have creativity blocks where I was like, oh my God, what else do you do? And it's really easy to hold yourself to the standard where if you're not doing like the next totally groundbreaking thing, then you don't feel like you're contributing. Sometimes you just have to take a step back and be like, here's the thing, here's the problem, here are the existing solutions. How can I make them better? What is better about this? I mean, medicine's been working that same way, right? Like they're not, they're innovating and stuff, right? But the innovation really means iterating. Iterating meaning like incremental improvements. Medicines existed for a long, long time, right? Antibiotics, for example, have existed for a long, long time. Well, now we have a ton of them. We have a ton of different ones. I mean, it used to be just like penicillin. Here you go, there's penicillin, right? Like grows on cheese or something, right? Or bread. I don't remember what it grows on. But they're like, hey, look, this solves stuff. And then things mutate, superbugs, all this crap. And you have to come up with new stuff, right? But this new antibiotic and this old antibiotic that I got from the cheese or the bread or whatever it was, um, this isn't a groundbreaking innovation. It's an antibiotic. It like kills bad stuff in your body. Well, so does this one. This one does a little bit differently, maybe more effectively, and it works against other ones that others didn't. You don't look at this and you're like, hey, you copied. Like, screw this thing. Like, penicillin all the way, right? <laughs> <laughs> so where am I going with this? Inspiration is kind of everywhere. Look at things, look at problems you're passionate about. Now, when I say problems, you might be like, oh, my Etsy shop is like jewelry. What problems are you talking about? We don't solve problems. Well, of course you do. Anything anybody buys solves a problem. Um, adding aesthetics to things tends to be a, a, something that we really like in modern culture because we don't have the same needs we used to, right? We don't have the same, like, um, you know, it's, not, it's no longer like I want a shelter. Now people are very particular about their shelter. They want a house that looks this so particular way. Well, at one point there was a time and there definitely are uh, in parts of the world and parts of this country themselves or itself where people would be happy with just any shelter, right? But for a large majority of people, um, they get pretty picky about what their shelter looks like and they want like certain aesthetics to it. Um, like we were talking about before, um, IMAX and whatnot uh, with the color, the colored cases and everything, right? It was no longer that we had these, you know, fantastic machines that do all sorts of like number crunching and uh, pr programs that make our lives easier in different ways, but eh, we want them to look pretty too. <laughs> well, why not? Well, why not? I don't know. I mean, I just kind of look around. I'm looking for kind of examples. And, you know, I've got like this light over here that it's not enough that it's just light. It has to be orange light now. <laughs> hooked up to my phone right or a hat like i want to wear a hat to keep the sun on my eyes well it's not enough that it's just a plain hat anymore with just plain fabric um just like a natural brown fabric but no now it has to you know look fancy it has to have like some awesome under armor logo on it and like a pattern and all this fun stuff it's not enough i'm just wearing a shirt my shirt apparently has to have lines on it <laughs> this is true 
Yeah. I think one of the cool things too about specifically Etsy in this space is that many of the sellers, not everyone on Etsy, but many of the sellers on Etsy are really passionate about what they're building and the products that they're creating. And they live that space, right? Um, no matter what it is. And when you're living in that space and the products that you're making not only resonate with you, but they resonate with your customers and your customers love you for them. When you see something that inspires you and you can find a way to fit it into your space, it's gonna resonate with your customers much better than if they went to uh, another store for that. Example, uh, greeting cards. Let's say I make greeting cards, right? And there's this cool new TV show that I'm into on TV, uh, Game of Thrones. I guess it's not new anymore, but whatever. And I'm like, man, I wonder if I could somehow work like a reference to this into one of my greeting cards that I'm making. And I come up with this awesome way to, to do it and I get it in there and I put this card out there. The card at me as a shopper now, if I'm looking for a, a greeting card like this, the one that I find on Etsy, I would think is gonna have a much better chance of resonating with me than one that I find in Hallmark, which is coming from a company who's got marketing people out there approaching the same thing from a different angle of, okay, hmm, what's popular with our customers right now and how can we work that into greeting cards, right? It seems less sincere, you know? And on Etsy, you come up with this wide spread of products that are built from this exact thing, people that are passionate about their craft and passionate about what they're making and naturally seeing these things in the world that inspire them to make different versions of their products or changes to their products or specific things. I think that's awesome. It is awesome. Now, one thing is, I'm sure some of the listeners are going to be like, hey, you can't just take Game of Thrones. That's a copyrighted, you know, concept, this and that. So I don't think Gordon's saying just you know, take a character, throw it on the front and no. completely steal it. But, no, but you can definitely <laughs> reference it, right? You can reference something that happened in one of the episodes or something that happened to one of the characters. You don't, you can't just steal the words right off of that. Right? Obviously, copyright issues with that too. But <laughs> if, you know, if I'm passionate about making my greeting cards and I also really enjoy this TV show, you're gonna find a way of tying those two things together in, in a way that's not completely copying the, that or using any kind of copyrighted material from that. Absolutely. Hey, we see that in big uh, big TV shows all the time, actually, right? Like how many times are things referenced, right? Like how many times is Seinfeld referenced in different places? Oh yeah. I mean, geez, the, our pop culture, again, all of these different shows and movies are not brand new original ideas. They reference a lot of different stuff. They take a lot of things, take those building blocks and kind of iterate from them. Um, so one of the things that I had in mind when starting this conversation about like originality and stuff is some of these saturated markets on Etsy where people feel really stuck. People feel really stuck because they're like, well, jewelry is so stat saturated. I don't know how to stand out. I don't know how to be different. Um, so I, I, again, I don't think you have to be something completely different. Like, hey, a necklace is a necklace is a necklace. Like. I get it, or earrings are earrings. Well, yeah, but people resonate with, like there's lots of success in those areas uh, where people are diehard fans of a specific brand for like really small quirky reasons. Uh, and you can have those small quirky reasons too. Mm -hmm. Figure out what, like, hey, here's a necklace, okay? And here's a style. And, you know, I have something like that, or I want to do something like that, but I wish it did this or that. Like it looked this other way. I want to solve this other problem with it. Um, you can totally do that. You can totally iterate on those things and stand out. Hey, yes, I, you know, am selling a uh, blue sapphire necklace, and this is what makes mine different. It's not just like the others because it does this differently. It could be part of the process. It could be part of. Uh, Usually specifies the result, but you know, I follow this particular process to get this particular result, and it is yep. different than the rest. And my customers appreciate that because yeah, some some of you might not get it, right? Like some of you totally don't understand. Well, why does this matter? Well, it's cool. You're not, you're not the customer for this because the customers know, yep. right? And kind of comes back to another book by the same guy is still like an artist, but show your work, right? And that is really powerful, especially on Etsy, right? People are on Etsy and they like the behind the scenes stuff. People love that stuff. Um, we were in Savannah, Georgia a couple months ago and walking down there like riverfront there and they have these candy shops and stuff like that. Uh, and in the candy shop, you go inside and they show you where they make all this stuff. And they make it, they, obviously they've laid it out to like, you know, really showcase 
and uh, be impressive the way they make like taffy and stuff like that. And how many restaurants have you seen where they have like that open kitchen concept? Because people like to see behind the scenes or you look at some of these chef shows. Why are they so popular? Because they're seeing things they don't normally see. They're seeing the behind the scenes of the working kitchen. So if you show your work, you showcase like, hey, I'm different because of this and I do this process. Well, don't just tell them the process, show them the process. Even if you don't do anything crazy different, just seeing your process builds extra value, builds extra credibility, builds extra relationship with them because they see what you're doing. They should, they see the work. People like that. People love stories and that's part of the story, right? That's how, how you made that thing. And that's exactly the kind of stuff you should be including in your descriptions and your about pages um, for your shop too. Include that stuff in there and explain to them, you know, why you chose those materials and you know, why you, you made this a certain way because that's all part of the story and people love hearing about that stuff. They sure do. Yeah, the story is everything. The story makes, the story is part of the product. The story is very powerful, especially on Etsy. People care. People are shopping on Etsy because they don't want something that was made in a, in a factory overseas and just exactly. mass produced, stamped out. Yeah. Oh, I love those earrings. Where'd you get them? Amazon. <laughs> Somewhere in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're made in China. I don't know. Yeah, right? no, I mean, that's the thing. Like, that's why people are shopping on Etsy. So that when someone does compliment their earrings, they can be like, oh, thanks. Yeah, I bought them from this person and they do this stuff and they use these, you know, this special material when they do it. And this is why. And they can go into that kind of detail and have that kind of cool conversation behind it rather than just like, oh, yeah, thanks. Exactly. There are probably more convenient ways to buy product than on Etsy if you don't care about the story. And so share the are. story. <laughs> right? Share your story back with them. Absolutely. Otherwise, what stops you from just, you know, going to the little jewelry showcase thing at Target? Or, you know, not even leaving the house and do the something prime on Amazon or things like that. Just really quick, don't care what the where it comes from, what the result, cookie cutter, doesn't matter if there's, you know, ten million other people with it. I mean, how many times have you like come across someone wearing the same shirt? I mean, the same shirt at the same time happens, let alone you're like, you know, how many times have you gone somewhere? Because, you know, typically the type of places you're going to hang out, you're going to see other people like you hanging out and surprise, they sell the same shirt to other people like you. And you're like, hey, I've got that same shirt. Fortunately, it's at home. It happens like a lot. And if it's something like that you don't care about, maybe you care, maybe you don't care. Right. But if you want something more unique, having something like from Etsy is going to be more unique. It's going to have a story behind it. It's not going to be just like the other one. It might be a shirt, but it's different. Yep. Shoppers know that, and they want that. That's why they're there. That's how they got to Etsy in the first place. Yeah, the ones that care know that. Now, that might not be everybody, but I think that's important, too. And we've talked about that before, that everyone is not your customer. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, you say, and that's okay. <laughs> you don't want everyone to be your customer. You want to be selling to people who are passionate about what you're making and then are going to mm-hmm. advocate that. They're going to... You know, they're going to tell their friends about it and they're going to be repeat customers. They're going to come back to you because you're delivering to them what they actually want and what resonates with them. Have we ever talked about the thousand true fans on this, on the podcast? I don't think so. Okay. We should definitely talk about that sometime. The thousand true fans is a concept that again pertains to art and uh, I think it was pioneered in music actually, but it was this concept of you don't need to be a huge like main headline band traveling the world to uh, like have a lifestyle supported by your art, by your passion in art. You, what you really need is a thousand true fans who are willing to, like when you do a show, however frequently it is, they show up, they like pay to get in the door, they buy your CD, they get some merchandise, that type of thing, and they support you because they love and care about what you do. Um, they enjoy it. So they're willing to support you with that. And uh, the math, for whatever reason, seemed to work out to about a thousand true fans. So keep that in mind. Again, you don't need six billion people or however many people there are in the world to uh, to be your customer, right? You don't need three hundred million people like Facebook needs, right? You just need more like a thousand. A thousand doesn't sound that bad. In fact, 
<laughs> back in the day uh, when we were first starting up Marmalade, looking at like a thousand customers, I was like, a thousand customers doesn't seem that bad. I even said, that seems like the number of people I could just call. I could just call a thousand <laughs> they people. They talk to you personally, <laughs> yeah. And get them all to sign up for Marmalade. Yeah, you know, because no, it, it doesn't. doesn't sound, a thousand doesn't sound bad. It's a big number, but it's not it insurmountable. Is. It's not like you look at it like a million. And you're like, right. oh, I'm so overwhelmed by this number. Right, like a million. So you talk to a million people for a minute, right? <laughs> one on one, not like a podcast, but like one on one. Just well, a minute. A, mil a million minutes is kind of a lot. That seems like a tough number to deal with, right? And I'd say you talk to them for five minutes. And we all know that's not going to happen either because a five minute call is, is pretty short. Um, especially for a first call with somebody. So five million minutes. Well, when you start talking about numbers like that, it's like, ah, I give up. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I can't do that. A thousand doesn't sound that bad, though. A thousand yeah. doesn't. And we're not saying you have to do that overnight either. So I don't know how we ended up on a thousand, but Finding oh, your everyone customer, customer. your customer. Right? Finding, yes. yeah. yeah. And everyone's not your customer, and that's a good thing. Yeah, whenever, it's kind of like that old saying, right? Like. If you try to please everyone, you please no one. Mm -hmm. If you try to make everyone your customer, you make no one your customer. Because <laughs> everyone doesn't like you for some other reason. Right. And there's also a saying that um, a third of people will like you no matter what you do. A third of people will hate you no matter what you do. And your job is to convince the one third in the middle to like you. There you go. There you go. So that's only 333 people. No, you still need 1,000. So, you oh, just right, have so to... 3,000. Yeah, you still got to go to 3,000. <laughs> 1,000 of them will right off the bat like you. Yeah, no matter what. And then, yeah. Yeah. But then there's another 1,000 that you can convince. Then you got 2,000 people. Yeah. But you won't convince them all. But don't worry about that last 1,000. The haters. No. Haters going to hate. No, never. Exactly. Haters going to hate. Always. <laughs> <laughs> and to think we started with originality <laughs> <laughs> yeah i feel like we kind of got off track there but that's okay. we did we did we wandered a little bit but that's all right that's, we did that's wander right. that's what we do so originality again doesn't exist we talked about we talked about a lot of stuff right here that is definitely not original uh we put our own ideas and spin behind it um and, you know, that makes it our own. We present it in different ways than others are. But look, I mean, just look at so much stuff that's being taught out there. Are people teaching brand new original ideas? No. No, no they're not. Um, every single day, people are using and teaching ideas that they put their own flavor on, but they're by no means original. Um, look at history, right? You can't invent history, but look how many different ways people teach history. Right? A lot of different ways. There are a lot of different ways. But it's not original. It can't be original. You're literally teaching something that happened in the past. That is factual. You, know, you can't what's change. Crazy, what's crazy about that is of all the ways of teaching history, my history teacher in high school picked the worst possible way to teach history. So if you're listening, Gordon did not like it. Yeah, Mrs. Brickley, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. But I, we all want to know now how <laughs> chose to teach history. Oh, I don't. It was just, it wasn't anything in particular. It just didn't work for me. It just wasn't how I like to learn. And that's part of the thing. That's part of the reason why there's so many different ways of teaching something is because everyone learns in a different way. If, you're, if I'm needing to approach something by just reading a book and then, you know, highlighting things and reciting back things from the book, I can't do that. It's just, I, I'm not going to retain information that way. Sorry, I can't do that. Okay, I completely agree with that. Um, that's how, <laughs> no, seriously, I always did awful in history. History presented the same way to me. It was pretty much here are this content that's not very interesting out of a book. And again, it's not that I've heard since then, I've heard history presented in much more interesting ways. Sure. Right? But it seems that the textbooks they choose. Uh, for history in schools all the way through high school is super boring and bland. And they're like, 
here's a list of events and the dates they happened and who was involved. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I've got no context behind why these events matter, what led up to them or who the heck these people are. Yeah. Um, why do I care? Oh, don't worry about that. Just memorize them. That's so you right. can take this test. Yeah. It's crazy. And so yeah. I'm, uh, I would just say if ahead. I'm lucky, I can somehow figure out how these things are connected. Like it's not even taught that way that they're all connected to one another. Like this goes to this goes to this. Like it's yeah. just, uh, it's yeah. It, it leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, not very good storytelling. Um, actually recently I saw a video of Bill Gates talking to, uh, it was a history teacher. I don't know what grade or anything, but he was a history teacher and he was explained to Bill Gates how he teaches history and how he has so many people engaged. And he uses pop culture references to teach history. He ties them back to other things he understands or that they, uh, they know about and understand. So then he ties it back to them. So I think that's called anchoring, right? You anchor information to things that you know, uh, so you can re uh, remember it and recollect it better. And I would bet um, in order to actually be good at doing that, that teacher needs to not only be passionate about the history subject that they're teaching, but also about the pop culture stuff. They need to be in tune with what's going on in the world that other people know about what's trendy at that point in time. That's not something you can force. You just can't like force yourself to do that. You have to have a passion for both of those things to do them and put them together in that way. That's going to resonate with people. Oh yeah. I mean, this guy definitely could have chosen references that would like the teaching circle would get. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the students would be like, what are you talking about, dude? And they would be just as ineffective as memorizing stuff. But he yeah. was actually using Star Wars to, I think he it was, I, I believe it was he was using Star Wars to teach civil rights, the civil rights movement. And he was going through the different Star Wars movies and he was equating different characters to, you know, like the different uh, sides, uh, uh, you know, of the movement and everything. And it, it sounded really good. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it made sense. And Bill Gates was very in, intrigued by this because, uh, you know, he's really big on education with his foundation and everything. And, Star Wars. you know, they sponsor Khan Academy and everything. I mean, that all makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it, you, <laughs> again, he's a good audience for learning it that way, I guess. So maybe he learned something while, he, while it was being explained. And that's why he looks so intrigued. Like, oh, my gosh, no one ever mentioned it that way to me before. This is perfect. But again... Hey, this this teacher's taking some of the history, mm -hmm. original Star Wars, not original. Putting them together and teaching them in a way that is original, and it catches attention, it caught Bill Gates' attention. I'm sure a lot of other people are paying attention to what he's doing too. Even though what he's doing isn't 100% original, he's still got his own path with that. He's got his own thing that he's building there, and that's exactly I think what people need to do is be okay with not being completely 100% original with something. But make it yours. Make it yours and own it. Yeah. Have high standards, but don't have impossible standards. Yeah. Don't have standards that actually stifle you and make it impossible from the start. Right. Because if that's your goal is to, you know, have this idea that, well, I'm not just going to teach history. I'm going to teach history with something that doesn't even exist yet. Not meaning like I'm going to teach it with two things that do exist. I'm going to invent something. I'm going to invent it. A, a movie teaching like method. Star Wars, yeah. but not Star Wars. But yeah. I'm going to invent that. First, I'm going to invent that. And I'm going to teach everyone about it, make it popular. And then I'm going to use that to pair it with history. It's like, no, no, no. Star Wars exists. People know Star Wars. These things already happened. I need people to understand these happened. They already know all this happened because they watch the movie. And they love it. Yeah. Maybe I could combine the two. And then they'll remember what's going on. And yeah. be interested at the same time. Well, that's one of the keys, too. I, th I would think with something like that, like the anchoring method, students are going to have a much better time re like remembering this stuff because they have something to connect it to, right? I always tell you when you're studying things or learning something new to try to relate it to something else so then you can kind of like make that connection later on when you're being quizzed on that material. So yep. I would think that anchoring something against like a pop culture reference like Star Wars or whatever else would really help in remembering how things are connected and how things work together and and what happened when people try this a lot of times um psychologically you'll see it in the media stuff like that right now the time of the recording maybe not the time you're listening but we are in an election cycle here in the united states and you will see a lot of persuasion at work and one of the methods um regardless of your politics one of the methods that 
any candidate is going to try, and uh, their supporters, for that matter, um, in the media, depending on which way they lean, is using anchoring itself there too. And what they're doing is they will compare either side, right, to something negative. They'll be like, yeah. and this is just like what whatever negative figure in history that I know everyone's familiar with, yeah. like Hitler is very popular. Stalin's very popular. These things are very popular because they're very readily available to just about everybody. And it's really easy to just point to and be like, that's totally a Hitler move. And it's like, and then people have, <laughs> people are anchored then to like the negativity that is surrounded by that, that they've been taught. Right. And all of a sudden, like it just clouds. And it doesn't matter what it is, right? Um, it, it's just all of a sudden that becomes a negative connotation. You don't know why, but now all of a sudden, every time I think of this other thing, I'm also thinking about like horrible crimes against humanity. Why am I thinking this? Why is this happening? You know, um, and it's That's why I can't anger. personally listen to Sarah McLaughlin music anymore. I don't know who that is. She's the one that did that commercial, the animal abuse commercial, and they had her song like going in the background while they're showing all these really sad images of animals being abused. <gasps> yeah, it's it, okay. All of her music. No. Actual no, real that's example, not though. A bad point, though. Music <laughs> is no, no, for real. Music does uh, bring out, like, if you ever, um, let, let's say, like, in the past, like, let's say, like, around graduation, like, high school graduation tends to be like a big event for people, right? Or like high school in general. Like, if you hear the music you listen to in high school, sometimes, sometimes it'd be like a song or something like that. Yeah. You'll have these kind of oh, deja vu, but like these familiar kind of feelings, and be like, wow, this. Feels different. Like this kind of feels like high school again. Yeah. Things like that, that anchoring, that association will kind of come back. So you really can kind of anchor stuff and kind of remember stuff. And like music can, and they do this, I believe, with uh, with like Alzheimer's patients and stuff like that, right? They they use things like this uh, to like subtly bring back stuff in the mind, bring uh, bring back memories and stories and stuff like that, um, yeah. where other techniques might not work as well. There's actually there's actually a whole thing around aromatherapy with that and like in and smelling things and bringing back memories and stuff like that purely from smell because it's a really connected sense. Uh, side story though, there is a commercial going on here, which is a political commercial that is doing anchoring. Which, as Richie was talking, it made me think of this. And either I'm a horrible TV watcher or or they're horrible at their advertising because I don't remember who specifically it's for. But they're comparing his his uh, political career that he had here uh, in Ohio with a clunker, right? So they're showing all these images of cars that are all like busted up and old and like rusted and like, boom, like big letters of what's going on on the screen. Another picture of a car, boom, more big letters and like big numbers, like bad numbers, like big bad number on the screen. And they're doing this with the whole time talking about this candidate and trying to like tie the two together between rusted old clunker car and Insert candidate name here. <laughs> right? And those are the things that they use them because they stick and they work. Right? That type of psychology, you might not notice it, but it works. And it's interesting when you do see it. And maybe when Again, I see his name on the ballot, I'll be like, oh, that's the clunker car guy. But I can't think of it right now. <laughs> or you'll just be avoiding it. You'd be like, Maybe. I don't know why, but this guy doesn't sound good. He reminds yeah. me of that car I used to have that always used to break down. <laughs> I, can't, I don't know why he makes me think of that car. Weird. I'll vote for the other guy. John, John Buick. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Chevy. Uh, I, had a, I had a Mercury Sable. I, my parents had a Mercury Sable that I drove when I was in high school, and that car was nothing but, nothing but problems, transmission issues. So for me, it's Mercury Sables. Which I don't even think exists anymore, but I think it was a Ford company, actually, one of their Ford Lincoln Mercury, something like that. I'm not familiar with him, Mister Mister Lincoln Mercury, Mister Ford Lincoln Mercury, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. It's very formal. Goes by middle or first, middle, and last name. Oh, well, he was in trouble a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. All right. Back to originality. Again, none of those things are original. They keep using things that, again, relate, you know, like a clunker. They didn't invent this. They didn't even invent anchoring, right? 
Yeah, these are things they just keep using. So stop holding yourself to too high of a standard. Understand there is always room for improvement. And uh, really just kind of add your passion to stuff. Yeah. Right? Look at something, uh, whether or not it exists out in the world already. Well, of course it exists out in the world, right? But uh, whether it exists um, in your industry in general, for example, we've got an industry of jewelry. Which I bring it up because I just see so many uh, shops that close because they say it's so so saturated. There is yeah. always room. If it was so saturated, people would be just continually dropping out. Um, yeah. But there there are there's always room to go in a different direction with the jewelry, and it doesn't yeah. have to be something that like kills your passion either. It can be something that that helps you follow your passion. Like hey, yeah. what I've been doing maybe maybe what you are specifically in is too saturated but you can make changes to it but those changes are going to make it more expensive fine then maybe you can follow your passion into a more into a higher end jewelry i mean i still you know when i cruise around still see uh like artisan type jewelers that make more expensive jewelry and they look to be doing pretty well right um, and you can do that on Etsy too. There's no reason you can't do that. There's no reason you just have to fit right in, right? You can still carve out a niche and say, boom, I used to do this. This was crowded. I started adding this and this to it. It's definitely more expensive. It's definitely more unique. And I can stand out, be more passionate about it. And my true customers, I don't have to have as many of them because it's a slightly more expensive product or a lot more expensive product. Um, but my true customers love it. And, you know, they're dedicated. And right over here, it's not so crowded. So the rest of the room, super crowded. I'm going to stand right over here. I actually like it right here better anyway. And ah, look at that. I got elbow room. How about you? Do you have some elbow room? A little bit. A little bit? Look at that. Hey. Hey, that wasn't original. <laughs> this is true this but is it's true. the first time we did it on etsy jam boom it's, yeah <laughs> that's true that's we took etsy all. jam took the chicken dance put them together boom originality <laughs> disruptive right there so disruptive dance along at home <laughs> and we can tell if you're not <laughs> <laughs> If you're on a bus, train, passenger of a car, not if you're driving. Just well, get, if you're driving, just, just do one arm. Oh, yeah, or be really quick about it. Steer yeah, with your really knees. With <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, or get let up, your do a little chicken drive dance. For you. There you go. Yeah. Or if you're in an Uber, do it in the backseat. Yeah, definitely. Or a taxi. Basically, as long as you're not driving. Yeah. Do the chicken dance. Right now. We'll wait. Yeah, go ahead. You're not doing it yet. All right, there you go. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> it was convincing. It, that was. All right, so get out there. Make things better. Make them your own. Get unstuck. Be positive and see how you can change things for the better. Because if you look around and you th say, hey, everything looks perfect the way it is and can't be improved, then you're wrong. Because they can. <laughs> hey, how many different light bulbs like are there that. right now? <laughs> I like that. You like that? Yeah. Well, it's true. Everything You might not see it right off, but anything can be improved. There's no way that everything is as good as it can be. No way. In fact, that would be sad. It would be sad if everything we had in front of us, anywhere you look, was as good as it could be. Because we just couldn't go forward. You, we, you couldn't improve things. Everything would be as good as it possibly gets. And that would be sad. That would be flatline. I won't have it, Gordon. I won't have it. Gordon won't have it. You listeners shouldn't have it. So go out there, make things better, and start with a listing in your shop. Go out there and make it better. And I don't even care if you sell vintage. Make it better. And I'm not saying you have to go change it, right? But find out what makes yours 
the best. Yeah. And if you're doing vintage, it might be about the story. You might have the absolute yeah. best story for it. People yep. love a story. You got a typewriter? All right. Well, who? maybe you could do a little history on that typewriter. Maybe you could yep. make that a little interesting. Because I'm sure that you know, it doesn't have to be Mark Twain's typewriter, but I'm pretty sure even if it's someone no one's ever heard of, that person who had that typewriter, unless they were like super boring, but maybe yeah. even if they were super boring, you'd be like, this typewriter started out being owned by the most boring person you've ever heard of. And then tell an awesome story about how boring they are. And people will love it. Cause I'd put that right over here on my desk. I'd be like, this typewriter, boring, very, very boring person had this typewriter, wrote the most boring <laughs> letters, okay, to their pet bird. Okay, and that's where it starts getting interesting, right? And just, it goes on. It just goes on. And that's a story. That's a story and that's how you can stand up. There you go. You like that? That's good. All right, excellent. All right, well, this is gonna conclude the, uh, what do we call this episode? Oh, we didn't get oh, the, the name. We oh, the name. there's, uh, uh, we might have to come up with another name, but this, concludes the episode about there are no original ideas uh so remember go check out marmalade uh go to marmalade.com forward slash blog to check out our blog also we have great blog posts and where also we turn these podcasts into blog posts so after you're done watching or listening to these uh you can also go back and reference them for all of these uh great nuggets that we drop um day after day in these episodes um uh, and also all the other cool tools and uh ooh, Soon to come, maybe already here, uh, depending on when you're listening to this again, <laughs> but we are launching some courses specifically for our entrepreneur members. So keep an eye out for those. Yep. Until next time, here's Richie signing off. All right, see you guys. <laughs>